the cloud right now. Okay. So if you don't want to be recorded, please um, go off camera. You can participate in the chat um, and someone else can read your question for you if you want to participate that way. So um, we'll start with land acknowledgement. Um, at Maryland's Built Environment School, we believe that it's important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respect to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. So we are excited to be here for the final event the final public event of our um, event series with Corey Henry. Um, and the theme of this whole semester has been fault. Um, and we've talked about this um, as a group um, through the different lectures in different ways. But as a refresher um, and maybe a kind of concluding reflection, um, the charge of the fault lecture series and event series acknowledges that as architects, and spatial thinkers, we are trained in the research, design, and management of assemblies. But we have been undeniably existing on a cultural, political, environmental, and moral fault line. Through the public lectures and events of this semester, we aim and have aimed to reflect on the loss, fissure, and inequities amplifying around us and aim to understand constructive paths towards uh, forward from fault to ownership, understanding, and change. So it's kind of the umbrella of where we've been this semester. Um, and we're really excited to have Corey here with us today. And I'm gonna pass it to Brian to introduce Corey and then we'll hand it um, over for the conversation. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm the director of the architecture program. Wanna welcome all of you here today to the final lecture in the, the lecture series. And I really wanna thank Lindsay May for working tirelessly this year to organize what was arguably, no, it's not arguably, what has been definitively the most diverse, inclusive, and exciting lecture series that the architecture program has ever hosted. And I just wanna invite students that are out there, or other faculty members that are out there um, over the course of the next couple of weeks and, and months of the summer, uh, if you have suggestions as to what we ought to be focusing on next year, please reach out to us, reach out to me, reach out to Lindsay, we're very, uh, excited about continuing the great traditions that are started here uh, as a consequence of this series. So tonight's lecturer, as you know, is Corey Henry, and I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, a few weeks ago, Corey suggested that we break out of the typical lecture mode by inviting Julie Gabrielli to act as the inquisitor or provocateur or the David Frost. Okay, I know that's dated. Or the Ellen, uh, Ellen DeGeneres. That is the person to ask questions. So uh, Julie will be asking questions of Corey throughout the course of the series, the, the presentation this evening. And so I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna introduce Julie briefly, just in case you don't know her, and then I'll get on to Corey. And so Julie Gabrielli is a clinical associate professor here at the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And she has taught and practiced architecture with a focus on sustainable design for over 25 years. And she received her undergraduate and graduate degrees in architecture from the University of Virginia. She's the founder and principal of Terra Logos, an eco architecture, Terra Logos eco architecture, and has had a solo practice in Baltimore for the last 14 years. Julie teaches ecological design thinking and co-coordinates the integrative design studio, Architecture 600 611, where she got to know Corey. Julie is also a painter and a writer. Uh, the essays and watercolors on her blog, Thriving on the Threshold, and I recommend that you take a look at this. Explore uh, this time of living between the cultural stories of separation from or belonging to the natural world. Her writing has been published online, in magazines, and in literary, literary journal, journals. She's participated in the uh, 2019 Orion Environmental Writers Workshop 
and is currently on, at work on a novel. And I can't wait to buy that, Julie. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland with her husband, teenage son, and a big dancing bear of a dog named Brody, who, if you follow him on Facebook, sings like you can't believe. Anyhow, Julie, glad to have you here tonight, and thank you for taking on this extra duty. So we're excited to have with us uh, uh, Mr. Professor Corey Henry, uh, who is a Bronx, New York City native and son of Jamaican Im immigrants. He's the director of design of his practice, Atelier, Atelier Corey Henry, and has uh, taught architecture at several institutions in the United States. Prior to uh, forming the Atelier uh, Corey Henry, uh, he was a senior designer at several renowned architecture firms, including Michael Graves and Associates. He has over 15 years professional practice and contributed to award-winning designs in residential, commercial, institutional, and urban, urban planning projects that spans three continents. Corey received his bachelor architecture degree from Drexel University, conducted research in new media and immersive environments and emergent technologies, uh, te technologies at Southern California Institute of Architecture, also known as SciArc, uh, and earned a post-professional uh, MARC II degree um, in, in architecture and urban design from Cornell University, Go Big Red, the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning, and his background led to an interdisciplinary approach to design through an integration of visual arts, architecture, and urban design. I'm proud to say that Mr. Mr. Henry is, Professor Henry is, the 2021 Key Distinguished Professor in Architecture. And what that means is that Paul Key, who was one of the two originally licensed architects in the state of Maryland, and his wife, Grace, established the Key Distinguished Professorship in architecture in 1967. The key distinguished professorship in architecture has played an important role in the life of the School of Architecture Planning and Preservation by recognizing eminent practitioners and scholars. According to the original agreement, the key professor is to be recommended by the dean and approved by the president, and, and, and the president of the university and the vice president for academic affairs. And a point, historically, um, and, and in, in, in continuity, those appointed to the key professorship uh, have gone on to do tremendous things that transform the world. Uh, Corey, Henry, welcome, and the floor is all yours, or the screen, should I say, is all yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? I had to switch mics. Okay, fantastic. So let me share screen. There we go. So I wanna say uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lindsay, Julie, and the University of Maryland for, for having me, uh, not only as the, as the key distinguished professor, but obviously to, to uh, give me the opportunity to talk about my background and some of the experiences that influences my, my thinking and approach as a, as a practitioner and an educator. Uh, I before Julie and I Julia and I get into a conversation again. I just would like to talk about my my background. My mother's from, uh, as Brian mentioned, Jamaica. Uh, she she grew up in rural poor Jamaica. Left when she was about seventeen. Uh, went to the UK to study, and uh, then after the UK, where she studied nursing, she moved to Toronto, Canada, and then settled in the Bronx, New York, where I was born and raised. I lived between, I spent a lot of time between the Bronx and Jamaica, the island where my family is from. Uh, she raised my, again, she raised my sister and myself in the Bronx. Quite a bit of a struggle. She often talks about the experiences that she had in the UK uh, because she was not only, not only black and one of the few that was in the school where she studied, but she was also from the Caribbean. And there was a lot of uh, prejudices and uh, uh, oppression that she that she faced. She often talked about it uh, growing up. But it also, she also had a world view. Uh, you know, she, when she was in the UK, she spent a lot of time traveling throughout Europe. She even traveled to to Mexico. I remember seeing those those photos. So when we got to the Bronx, you know, the environment of the Bronx, I, I would say, lives up to some of its reputation. And she made it a point to have us be as well, I say, well-rounded as possible, and make sure that our environment doesn't necessarily uh, uh, speak to who we are as as people or thinkers. 
Uh, the challenges of the Bronx is well documented, but a lot of it is out outside of the hands of those who occupy the borough, right? So uh, the photo to your left is an iconic photo of the burning buildings in the South Bronx. Uh, the photo to the right is the, the, Bron the Cross Bronx Expressway uh, done by Robert Moses, uh, both again outside of the hands of the occupants of, of the borough, of the neighborhood. Uh, this is this is not just a condition that you see or have seen in the Bronx. I mean, this this happened in inner cities uh, throughout the country. Uh, the Bronx, for those who don't know, the burning building is in the Bronx were real estate developers and building owners who burned the buildings for for gain from insurance. Uh, so it left a lot of people homeless and desolate. The and the Cross Bronx Expressway is one of those um, moments of, and I, my, for those that's in my public seminar lecture, hear me call it violence against the community, uh, where you have this huge infrastructure uh, placed in that bifurcates the community and reduces the amount of resources they could get and just totally destroys the area. Uh, again, this is some images of, of my neighborhood. Uh, I grew up in North Bronx, uh, Wakefield. Uh, predominantly Caribbean uh, community. I actually did not know for, until I was about, I'd say seven years old, I thought that every black person was from, from, was from Jamaica or Haiti. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, I, again, I grew up in a, in a huge uh, Caribbean community. My mother, I was really good at art very early on, just as I guess an innate ability. So my mother got me involved in different art programs. And by the time I was Seven, seven or eight years old, I was taking art classes throughout this. I was doing different things throughout the city. Uh, there was an art professor at Lehman College, which is in the Bronx, that I, where I studied for a little while, uh, again, as a kid. And he brought us, he would always take us to Manhattan uh, and for me to see some of the different shows that, that was taking place. I think a lot of it had to do with just trying to get me outside of, of the Bronx and hanging out with some of the friends that I was hanging out with, even at that young age. Um, one day he asked, uh, I think I was, I was at this point, I was like in sixth grade. This is a photo that my mother pulled up <laughs> when I was giving this lecture before, or giving a similar lecture before. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, he asked, you he, he were doing realist drawings, but he asked me to draw anything that I want. So I drew this. He was pretty excited about it. But then he really broke down the, the work and said that, you know, he told me that my, my passion was in storytelling, which is absolutely correct, because even in the present day, you know, I use narrative as a way to try to develop, understand, and even present some of the some of the work. Uh, he also made it a point to always talk about uh, Basquiat, which I didn't understand at the time because I was I, honestly truly I was young and you know I wasn't really into into the work of of uh, Jean Michel Basquiat, but I began to realize that it had less to do with the work of Basquiat, but who Basquiat represents as a, as a black person within his, the artistic realm when there isn't a lot of black people there. So even at that young age, he was giving me someone to identify with. Another, but during one of the shows, there was a show at MoMA where uh, Duchamp was, some of his work was being shown. And that, I, I, that was something I actually became really interested in. Uh, not because of the work per se, but because of the critique that Duchamp was making, not only on the art as, as a creative, but also his critique on the, on the kind of, on the discipline and the, the field of art I, I was fascinated with. Uh, as I started to, as I started to uh, progress a little bit, you know, I don't know why, but my mother was, my, my mother did not want me to do art. She was trying to, and it's, you can't determine a kid's career at that young age. Uh, but again, uh, it was suggested that architecture would be a good field. Oh, also, there was a movie that came out called Mannequin, and I was in love with the movie, and I wanted to design either clothes, comics, or design uh, storefronts uh, because of this, this movie Mannequin. So then it was suggested that I do art. I, I think about architecture. My mom used to, my mother used to buy these. Uh, she was, bought a subscription to Architectural Digest. So there became a point where my my room was filled with boxes of architectural digest. So that was kind of my introduction into architecture. Uh, as I mentioned though, we would travel throughout New York City a lot for a lot of these art shows. And even though I became, you know, again, I was interested in design from very different as from multiple aspects, from architecture to just the design, again, storytelling, and also which links to the, the design, the interest into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the uh, shows. Uh, but it was also what I also became to uh, see 
throughout our travels throughout New York City, especially a lot of it was in uh, Times Square. I became fascinated in Times Square, uh, and but and I, I think by the 1980s, I think mid 1980s, it was referred to by uh, uh, by Rolling Stone as the sleaziest block in America. But it was changing quite a bit at that time. Uh, and again, I was really fascinated in it because of the social and cultural life that was happening in, in Times Square. It was Times Square represented for me at the time, as, as sleazy as it may be to some, was that it was a transparent connection of, of multiple different worlds in one place. I mean, it was like the truth about society. Uh, but as I mentioned, it was changing quite a bit. And by the early 90s, uh, the city and the state began to condemn a lot of the, you know, the sex shops and the abandoned buildings that was in Times Square. Uh, the city basically took it over uh, and used eminent domain as a way of doing so. Uh, an example would be the New York Times headquarters, uh, where they got through tax abatement deals, renovations, and again, the abusive practice of eminent domain. Uh, but during this time, there was another phenomenon that began to happen that I was also very much aware of in real time. And it was that the Bronx began to see a wave of crime I remember my white neighbors calling it a, uh, abandonment, and they were one of the last to, to leave in what I later became, later understood as, as white flight. Uh, and, and to give a perspective of the level of crime in the Bronx during this time, is that the Bronx is still known as probably the most challenged borough in New York City, uh, but the overall crime rate today is 70% lower than it was in 1990. Uh, this is my mother, my sister, and myself. Uh, circa seventh grade, I think, or eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade. Uh, my mother's five six, so that gives you kind of a, a comparison to how where I was at the time. And the reason why I mentioned that is because I do want to tell a quick a quick story. A friend of mine who lived up the block was his aunt was having a, a party, and as she was, and so again it was an adult party. It was at night, so maybe like eight o'clock a little. And uh, he and I were playing outside in the front. And at some point, I just took off running after him uh, as he ran in the backyard. It, it's a, it was a small alleyway before you get to the backyard. And I mean small, I, I shouldn't even call it an alleyway. But in between these two homes, and I took off after him. Uh, when he stopped, I stopped, and we were just laughing and joking. And all of a sudden, I was tackled from behind. And then I could see all the adults screaming. I didn't know what was, what was happening. Again, I just I hit the floor hard. It was a cop. Uh, he, was, he was yelling at me, asking me where I threw something. He, I guess he... You thought I threw something, a, a gun or something away. Again, you could, I'm keeping the picture up so you can understand what I looked like at that time. Uh, and he put his gun to my temple. And my, you could see everyone around uh, in fear and shock and disbelief. They were yelling. I was hoping that people would stop yelling so it doesn't make him nervous. But the other, other thing that was running through my mind was, all right, this is where I'm going to die. But also he's going to get away with it because I looked around and everybody around were black. And I said, there's not one white person here to vouch that I didn't do anything wrong. So he is going to get away with what's about to happen. Obviously, uh, it ended better than that. But it was a, it was a, it was a moment that I remember. I, and I also, before the lectures, uh, these lectures, I, I, I told my mother that there's something I would talk about. And she said, that could, you know, that's just one of 82 things that I could, I could uh, discuss, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I would later on go on to the study at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is a minority majority city, over 40% of the city is black. However, it consistently ranks as one of the country's most segregated cities. Uh, over 25% of the citizens in Philadelphia live below the poverty line with a major, with a majority being in the black and brown community. Um, and this is a, and Philadelphia has a clear system that maintains, if not exacerbates this, this situation. Uh, the Brookings Report recently released their findings that in Philadelphia there's a significant gap in racial earnings, even among I, even among identically identically uh, educated city, citizens in the city, uh, with white workers receiving almost 25 25 thousand more in annual income over black and brown workers with the same education. Uh, and this gap is also seen in the built environment. The first firm that I worked for focused on community development projects. I worked with them while I was a student at Drexel with Drexel's co-op program. Uh, the, the firm was well versed in navigating the complexities of affordable housing credits and requirements. And I, I learned a lot of being there. However, good design was never part of the discussion. And then, and no one in the room were 
uh, where were from these communities or even looked like those from the communities, but they were making decisions uh, for the community. And none of these decisions affected the conditions that, that they were, uh, would ultimately feel. Uh, that bothered me quite a bit. And also I was, I was I, I, you know, I, I did solid in school. So I, I was really looking for uh, some design opportunities and some more critical engagement in architecture. I was choosing between a well-known uh, international firm that delves primarily in uh, critique of design and, and uh, analysis of program within architecture. Uh, then I got a phone call from a principal at Michael Gray's office in Princeton, New Jersey. I went to visit the office and it was an amazing experience. They, they designed everything from the doorknobs to the, to the building. And while not, the design language was not necessarily what I was interested in, it was, you know, Michael Graves, uh, his broad search for inspiration toward the conceptualization of projects was inspiring. And again, he operated on all scales. Uh, approximately, the other thing too was that approximately seven years earlier from when I was there, uh, Michael was sick and became paralyzed and spent a significant time in the hospital. Uh, he became committed to using his design abilities to address the functional and aesthetic ills that he saw in hospital furniture. And he did not only base it on his own experience, uh, the office consistently researched and analyzed hospital spaces and furniture to find problems to address. And I became very much interested in this and spent, I uh, spent some time, quite a considerable amount of time there working on a variety of projects. And after a few years, I became, began to have an itch for something more in terms of exploration and artistic creativity. But I, and I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to actually pursue architecture. I wasn't sure if that was the discipline that it would be. Uh, but at the time, uh, I was also on the verge of entering a design competition as well as thinking about graduate school. Uh, so I went to a few, I was exploring this, uh, both New York and Philadelphia a lot more than I had in the past, going to different art galleries and shows. And uh, I met someone at a Pepe, uh, Pepona Osorio installation show. Uh, he was on a, he was actually a professor from Penn that was on one of my reviews earlier and we had a great conversation. And then he ultimately decided for me to connect with Philip Freelon. Uh, unfortunately, no, Philip Freelon is no longer with us, but for those who don't know, Philip Freelon was a, is a, predominant, is a prominent uh, black architect. His practice was in North Carolina. I was, I wasn't nervous about talking to Philip Freelon, but I wasn't sure about how much time he would commit. And very quickly, he, uh, when I first spoke, I had sent him my CV before we spoke, my portfolio. And when we got on the phone, he clearly had not seen it. And then he said, when he did open it, he says, okay, I'll call you right back. And I was nervous. I was, I was thinking, oh man, my portfolio must really suck because he's not going to call me back. But he did call me back and we ended up having a three hour conversation. And it was, it was a very um, impactful conversation. Uh, we spoke less about work, his work, and spoke more about his experiences in navigating the field and the discipline. Uh, I would ultimately choose a SciArc as a school to go to, uh, first study at, uh, which is in Los Angeles, the Southern California Institute of Architecture. I chose SciArc because it was very different. It might be, might be the polar opposite of my undergraduate education. I, I should also say that while I was at, at Drexel, uh, Drexel is a, is a school that prepares you very well for the practice of architecture. Uh, but for a lot of the things that I was interested in, I made, made it a point to really get, get out of the school. I spent, also, I spent a lot of time at the University of Pennsylvania, which is directly next door, uh, even driving up to uh, Princeton University. So. Again, I wanted something a little bit different, uh, quite different than my undergraduate education itself. Also, there were so, also other things that I was uh, very much interested in, including cinema and design, uh, design and cinema, and it's, uh, SciArc offered the opportunity to delve into those issues. Uh, so I went to Los Angeles. I was at SciArc for a while, and then I went to Cornell to get my master's of, of architecture and study of design theory, design and uh, urbanism. I had a very busy, busy time in, uh, in Ithaca. And but while I was in a, at Cornell, I took a, a visiting critic named Tomo Berlanda, who was the director of the Kiss School in Rwanda. Uh, he was a, a, I took his studio, and the focus of the studio was in affordable settlements in Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, during that semester, I actually connected with a planner in Rwanda while I was there. 
uh, which years later to, uh, led to me doing a concept uh, design for an athletic center. And it was received very well, uh, but unfortunately it was, never, it was not built. Uh, however, what it did do was plant the seeds for other opportunities, which I, which I will probably get to uh, soon. So at this point, I'd, I'd worked as a C, I worked as a senior designer for several firms and had amassed a, a, a decent portfolio of work. And then I decided to start my start a practice. Uh, it started with a, a res small residential project. And then the city of Los Angeles asked, reached out and asked if I would be interested. Oh, and I'm sorry. It started with a residential project. And then I also, uh, I did a redesign for, I was doing a redesign for LA Candor, a nonprofit organization that's in Skid Row, Los Angeles, who works with the homeless. Uh, I guess through that, the city of Los Angeles reached out to me to see if I'd be interested in working on a project to kind of address the, the many complexities and issues of, of the homeless here in law, of the houseless uh, here in LA. Uh, for those who don't know, housing security is a nationwide problem, uh, but California is home, is, is home to three of the top five cities with the worst numbers of this crisis. Uh, and there are many reasons for this, from the lack of housing development to meet population growth to the continued effects of systemic discriminatory uh, policies such as redlining. Uh, and so what you're looking at now is a graphic of Los Angeles County. The noted area is Skid Row, which is a small community in regard to land size and near downtown Los Angeles. However, Skid Row is known for having one of the highest density of unhoused population in the world. Uh, so you, here you see, for those who have never been to Los Angeles, I'm showing you, you know, where you see DTLA, that's, that's downtown Los Angeles, University Park, uh, Fashion District in Skid Row and in South Central Los Angeles. And you can kind of see how the highway kind of bifurcates these areas, or, uh, or barriers around it, borders around these areas. And here, if you, again, just keep an eye on that graphic, uh, is no, the homeless population in downtown Los Angeles is about 5,350. And over 3,000 of that is in that small area known as Skid Row. Uh, to the left, you'll see where I've isolated, I noted that's the University of Southern California, and that small sliver to the top right is SciArc. One of my qualms when I was at SciArc was that very few of the studios actually engaged the very area that it sits and spoke about, again, these, very, these, these conditions uh, immediately around it. So as I met, uh, Los Angeles in itself has the second worst homeless population in, uh, in the nation uh, after New York City. But because of the warmer weather here, uh, there are more unsheltered houseless. Over, uh, over 3,600 residents of Skid Row live on the streets or in like temporary beds and shelters. The Skid Row is notorious for having the country's largest concentration of a house living on sidewalks, alleys, parks, and public areas. The lack of housing, mental health, health care facilities, and what would become criminalization of of just being houseless. Uh, the residents of Skid Row felt that their needs were being ignored, if not threatened. Uh, the community is desperate for immediate resources. As I mentioned, I collaborated with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity to create a personal care center for members of the community experiencing uh, homelessness. So the project is was called the Refresh Spot, and it's a community-driven project that provides the Skid Row community with access to restrooms, showers, and laundry facility with supportive services such as linkages to providers in the area and phone charging. Uh, it's a public facility open to anyone in the community and is, and is open 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, and I came in again with the, in, in the phase of programming for the project and we occupied a, a parking lot, which is very poetic for those who know Los Angeles and their fidelity toward the car. So, uh, but I do wanna show a quick clip of uh, one of the community engagement um, conversations. Corey, can you turn up the volume on it? I'm sorry? Can you turn up the volume on it? Or oh, are we I hearing something? Yes, you should be. Oh, I apologize. Let me. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. Thank you for letting me know. There we go. All right. Let me. 
go back. See, when, when, we, when we look at the, the status of homelessness, whether we're talking about homeless men, homeless women, homeless children, black, white, Latino, we have to first remember, just because I'm homeless, I still have a human right. And my human right is to dignity, to be able to take a shower, to be able to use the bathroom. This is the only place in downtown that will allow you to do one or the other or both of them. You have no other spot like that. And so therefore, if we don't come together now, then they win. They win. We have to take back our community and we're going to take it back by force. If we have to get the entire Kid Row community involved, we will do that because we want to be able to see these people have a bathroom to go to 24 hours a day and have a shower to take 24 hours a day. There's nowhere on, bro. you can do that Amen. but here in Skid Row. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that he said that I, don't, that I want to make sure is absorbed. Is One is uh, he referred to them as the Skid Row community. Uh, that's ex one of the important things to acknowledge, right? Is that they're houseless, but they're a community. A lot of these, a lot of the, the residents of Skid Row don't want to leave Skid Row. They just want the conditions to improve. They want opportunities uh, for them to to climb up the ladder, uh, right? From this very difficult position that they're in. Uh, when I was asked to come on to the project, a lot of the, you know, obviously within architecture, a lot of times architects say, okay, we what is can we do a house? Can we do a, you know multi-unit development for them? And for for me, it was to come in and engage and have a conversation and just figure out how can I be impactful at this moment in time as quickly as possible with the resources that we have. And again, it was to occupy the site and create these series of hygiene centers. Uh, the graphic that I'm showing right now is actually the most compelling graphic that was completed for the entirety of the project. Uh, I and I will fully admit that they're not particularly compelling in and of itself. But the reason why I'm showing it is so that you understand is that this was a multi-year uh, process. This was three, maybe was it five years, uh, or three years. Uh, that's a long time for something that should be done relatively quickly. And it just had to do with the bu uh, bureaucracy and, and working with the different city departments that were operating in silos. So as I mentioned, the site offers a place for people to have their basic needs met with dignity. Uh, the refresh spot program comprises of uh, three components, hygiene services, services, support services, and community engagement and resource navigation. Now, originally thought to serve approximately 100 people per day, the center was closed and expanded to serve the needs of over uh, 350 Los Angeles citizens per day. So again, this is a project that necessarily fits within the uh, the standard purview of, let's say, quote unquote architecture. But uh, it was one thing, I guess, I, in, in one aspect, challenges the agency of architecture, and another, and, and, and more importantly, speaks to the immediate needs of the community. And as I mentioned, it was thought to be a one year pilot, but it was expanded, uh, and it will be expanded to other sites post COVID. I'm actually going to skip that because we're, sh we're short on time. A uh, circa 2017, I was I was contacted by the actor, model, activist Mari Malik to design a school in her native South Sudan. Uh, several people from the previously previously mentioned athletic center in Rwanda recommended that Mari and I connect. Uh, the project was originally uh, supposed to be in South Sudan and quickly uh, changed to a desire to have it be a prototype to be built on several locations in rural Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so the three sites were Juba, South Sudan, Api, Uganda, and uh, Busugu, uh, Rwanda. So in the conversations that, that Mari and I had and some of her team in South Sudan was to figure out like, what do we want to do in terms of the, the school? She had built schools previously, but obviously you know, I wanted to do something different than the standard logist that she was receiving and have received in the past. Uh, some of the things I was very much interested in was obviously access, empowerment, and social Im impact, uh, the use of local materials and labor uh, to help try to build a local economy in some regard, and then cultural references to have the project look uh, as if it's from a, this particular uh, place. So here you can see some of the things, some I just some images that was inspiring. Uh, you could see, you know, the 
education being done under the shaded tree. Uh, the, the second picture is actually, you see Mari in center and then some of her, her students. One of the things that Mari's schools have all focused on was having it be all for girls because uh, acts, uh, female access to education in some of these rural communities is extremely difficult, if not impossible. But one of the things we talked about was that, you know, a lot of times they have to leave school early. And then there's a disconnect between how men in some of these communities view women. They don't necessarily view them as equals. So we wanted for these three schools was for they to have, to be side by side through their early educational process. So, so that hopefully that changes some of the, the social conditions. The third was the use of local materials. And again, the, the cultural reference uh, uh, to, the, to the far right, which we'll, we'll talk about very quickly soon. In terms of local materials, rammed earth was selected due to being able to be procured locally from all three sites. And, and, um, and then also it's, uh, so for those who don't know what rammed earth is, it's constructed by compacting moistened so uh, subsoil into place between uh, two uh, temporary former panels. Uh, what, we've, what I've looked at was using fly ash from coal power plants in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. That'd be used as a binding aggregate rather than concrete so that when dry, the result is actually de a dense, hard monolithic wall, even more so than using concrete. And while there are no co coal power plants in the three nations that we're working in, there are some uh, just south in Zumbai, uh, Mozambique, Botswana, Nambia, and South Africa. As mentioned, being a prototype that would be located in various countries and regions in Africa, revealing its deep contextual, uh, contextual uh, narratives, cultural narratives was a challenge due to the incredible diversity in Africa. So each nation, each environment, ecology had their own story um, and history. But nonetheless, I kept coming back to the ring form for several reasons. Uh, the design of the school takes its reference from pre-colonized East African art and inspired by the imagery of the teachers in rural communities conducting tree under the uh, conducting class under the tree and then the gathering that surrounds and expands around them. So the ring form grows from the centralized courtyard and again inspired by that under under the tree experience of education and then visual connections creates an environment that encourages dialogue and uh, collaboration. So here you see the transition community areas that blend along the ribbon. And then this is the exterior of the project. And then the last project that I'll quickly talk about is the Frankfurt Chocolate Factory. Uh, the Chocolate Factory is in uh, Washington. It was in graduate hospital section of South Philadelphia. Uh, it was built in the, in the 1880s and it started as a business that was making cho those chocolate rabbits that people give away on Easter. Uh, and in 2007, plans to turn the shuttered factory into Vietnamese themed mixed use development of project uh, fell through. I was contacted by another developer who was really interested in developing this 100,000 uh, 100, square foot abandoned uh, warehouse. And again, it's been abandoned for several decades. It sits along an industrial corridor that is rapidly changing. So what you see in yellow is all these industrial buildings. And then what you see in blue are residential row homes. And then the dense urban area does not have a grocery store and is considered a food desert. Uh, along with the requested community benefits for development along Washington Avenue, the, the community wanted to see a supermarket or grocery store come into place in other areas that they could. Uh, potentially sell goods, uh, but they really loved the, the factory, so much so that in 2018 it was placed on the National Registry. And here are images of the factory. What's it, so in, in the examination of the factory, which it, it was clear that it, the original building was built onto over time. So this diagram shows the different compo components of the factory that was built over several decades. Uh, as I mentioned, the original factory was, was built in the 1800s. And then over time, different additions uh, resulted in this compound of structures that's on the site. Uh, I wanted to retain the historical significance of the factory to the community and focus the ground plane on the public realm. So I propose removing the additions, keep the original building and then create a public plaza around the front. So in section, you kind of see the existing condition and then the proposed condition uh, below. Uh, parking was a requirement, but then what we found is that based on the footprint, we could actually have significantly more parking than what was required. 
uh, part we, the developer that hired me for the project was absolutely fantastic and we decided that we'd actually you do more parking and then devote and then allow residences that does not even live within the boundaries of our site to have access to that to that parking lot so again to take ease off of the, the streets oh uh, one of the additions uh, expanded one of the additions on the, on the existing building expanded the modest loading dock and it created a gaping hole in the facade of the factory. Uh, here I introduced what we call the cultural atrium. And this atrium is to house large, uh, large it was a large area that's used to house various events uh, for the community. And part of that would also be a satellite arts exhibition space from larger cultural institutions, including the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the atrium acts also acts as an entrance to the project itself and it connects to the community to this very arts educational and programming that's housed there and also the retail that would be inside uh, we saw this as as the, the developer and i also looked at it as having the retail space be incubator spaces for the community to set up shop and sell goods so the factory is repurposed to this mixed use and retail food market and with a double height space on the first level what I forgot to mention on this section is that we removed the entire second level to create this double height space. Our residential units are on the upper levels and then uh, within the retained structure and then prefabricated second level row home modules rest above the existing warehouse itself. And then these modules are an explicit link to the urban fabric of Philadelphia. Uh, the modules sit back from the edges of the factory to create outdoor spaces. So then this is that the next level, which is essentially the third. And then you can see it, it creates an interior courtyard. There's a bound, there's a, um, sorry. So here in this, oh, excuse me, maybe a little bit, there we go. Here in the section, you could kind of see to the right of the new proposed is that we were able to create a, a private courtyard based on this huge storage unit that was at the back of the warehouse. So that's what you see at the center here. The, the warehouse had a, had a very, it was, it was an oddity in of itself because the, none of, the grid was very, very loose. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't on the typical 30 foot grid. It was at moments, it was at 15 feet, 30 feet, and then 17 feet. Uh, but we use that as an opportunity to create different uh, unit types. So then, we, as you can see with the different color variations, we have, the, we have, I think we have about 20 different unit types within this, within this project. But that also became an argument for us to have uh, not only just not um, like multifamilies. So the, you know there were one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. There are units that that they wanted to really push to have uh, diversity within it, and not again, and not just in you know uh, a family uh, size, but also um, uh, econ economy. Uh, so the, we're, the developer was also very much interested in going up to twenty five percent affordable units. So then I know I skipped over it really quickly. Yeah, so then as you can see with the removal of all of the additions and, the, and opening up of the public space and the, and the introduction of the atrium, it really transforms the front from being something that was devoted to uh, purely the warehouse and something that is clearly devoted to the public. This is that back area that I was, that I was mentioning. And that's again, that's something that we transformed uh, to this. And that's it. I think I ran way over time and I apologize, Julia. We have until six, so we got plenty of time overall. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So I'll stop there. Yeah. So again, I, I and I do want to make it a point to say that, you know, so the three projects that I showed just fit fit in line of the, the thread of the of the of the uh, series of, of lectures. Is that we do? I still do a diversity of work. I, you know, I have a residence in Homo, Italy. I just picked up something from a field developer again, and we also have a residence in Utah. Also doing a a uh, a kind of a cultural center in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City. So. Hmm. Cool. Um, okay, well, I, I think I know what I'm going to ask you first, because you mentioned meeting. Um, it was great to see the sweep of your work, by the way, just to um, to hear your background, kind of the different educational experiences you had. So um, uh, I thought it was a really great kind of 
summary from because one of my questions was how did you become interested in architecture and i love that i can totally picture these boxes of architectural digest your mom's like you're going to be <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't want you to starve um so but what i was thinking was um when you mentioned uh meeting phil freelon and talking to him for three hours <clears throat> as much about architecture as uh, i'm sorry as much about his experience navigating the profession as about you know buildings or design so i was curious in that light um if you would be willing to tell us about maybe a difficult or diff disappointing experience that you've had in your career how you handled it um what you learned and how it affected um, your approach to future projects yeah yeah i i will and that I, I, you know i'll jump right into what we were talking about <laughs> before the uh... right the uh, the most so I've ex I've experienced quite quite a bit uh, in the in the field from from the from the point of entry to in education to starting a practice to you know running a practice um, and at each point in time I really said to myself I I really felt as if I was the only one going through it because I was the only one in that space who understood at at, at those moments of time. I was like the only one in this space who looked like me. And I just said, well, maybe I'm the only one going through it. Even if there's a, even if there's a, a black practitioner at another firm, right? They may not be experiencing what I'm experiencing. And I say all that to say the worst experience I've had was I I won a project and it was it was a public project. And how 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 it's set up is the city. The city held out an RFP for these certain projects. The, the programming of itself was devoted to a certain tax that would contribute to the building of rec centers and libraries, primarily in Black communities. And then nonprofit organizations would fill out for this RFP. Well, I was, I was contacted by a nonprofit organization and say, hey, would you be willing to team with us to go after this huge project? We won the project and I got a, I got a, actually got a phone call from the nonprofit organization saying we won the project. And then 15 minutes later, I got a phone call from people from the city saying, we are glad you got the project, right? We want you on this project. So it was a really exciting time. And we, I was introduced to the community by the mayor. I was introduced to the community by the councilman. We started community engagement. The way that I always start any project is, is listening. This was, a, this was a community in South Philadelphia, which is very much like the Bronx. But at the same time, if I do a project in the Bronx, I'm listening first. Uh, so I sat back, I listened to the community. We, the community, we had a, we had a great chat. Uh, I flew back to LA, flew to Philadelphia, did the same thing again, had a, had a community engagement, flew back to LA the second time. And then I got a call from the nonprofit organization saying that we, they want to move in a different direction. And I was like struck. I didn't understand why. Again, because we didn't start design, we were still in community engagement phase. They had actually hired a community engagement consultant from Los Angeles as well, who is not far from where I am now. And I said, then I immediately asked why? And they said, well, first, no, they, I apologize. Let me take a step back. First, for all the architects here, my fee was around 10% of construction costs. They wanted me to do it for 0.6% of construction costs. And I said, there's absolutely no way. And then, then I asked, uh, so why is this, what, what's happening? They said, well, because you live in California, it's, it's difficult. And I said, the community engagement people, the people who really need to be there is around the corner from me. Long story short, they, they, hired one of their friends to, to move up forward with the project. Um, but it was devastating for me on several reasons because another thing that came from that call was a series of attempted excuses as to why I was being let go before they hired their friend. And one was they don't, under, they don't think I understand the trauma that, that this black community has faced. And then on the call were, and no offense to anybody in the room, but there were privileged people who do not look anything like the community telling me this. It was shocking. It was shocking for several reasons. It's shocking that we, you know, one, you got the project because of me again. And I know this because the people from the city called me to tell me 15 minutes after the original call. 
uh, two was that the, there would be this sense of parentalism for, and the sense of um, privilege to actually say to me that, that a son of an immigrant who grew up from rural poor and urban poor from the Bronx, who's gotten to wherever it is I am, don't understand the, the trauma of the community. That was, that was the most traumatic thing that I've experienced in, in the profession. As a matter of fact, I think it's the most, one of the most traumatic, traumatic things I experienced in my life. And remember how I started with a cop holding a gun to my head. <laughs> so it was just, it was just, it was just a realization that there's always going to be an obstacle there. And even if you think you're ahead, there's a, just another, there's just another obstacle uh, in the way. And it was, and it was more, I mean, seems like on the face of it, it was an argument about your fee. It, it, well, it, but it clearly wasn't. Yeah. It, I, I'll be honest. So again, the fee, the fee was lower than what the typical fee would be. And yeah. again, coming from an office like Graves, where I don't mind to speak about their fees, but it's a well-known practice, right? Uh, you know, 10% of construction costs is really, is really nothing to navigate any considerable mm -hmm. project. Um, and then Ultimately, I think there ended up being like three different architects on board. At one point, you just let go of a black architect in the black community. You have to, you have to make something happen. So I think they ended up having. At some point, they ended up having three different architects on this on this project. But anyway, but yeah, that was that was the most traumatic experience uh, experience that I have. Which may lead into. I have a feeling. I don't know for sure. But if you don't ask a, a question, uh, a certain question, I, I'll bring I'll bring up a topic because it also leads into. Unless you want me to just jump right there and keep running. No, just jump there. That's great. <laughs> One of the worst things that schools have done thus far, to in my personal opinion, is is go into inner city communities and say and try to and say that we're going to recruit kids from inner city communities right now. I think that's one of the. I, I don't think it's a bad move, but I, I I don't think it's in the top three moves that schools should be doing at this moment in time. It has to do with, uh, and I'd be, I'd be honest, my experience, that one experience, but the experiences that I've had, I think, it's, I think it's pretty unfair to do that. I think the system needs to be changed quite a bit before we start inviting people to come into conditions that is not, right? I think you have to make the space first. I think, you, I think there's a lot of house cleaning that needs to be done first to be inviting for that to happen. Because again, I've, I, when I was in Drexel, when I was at school, there were there were three black students. I, I I was one. I remember one. I remember when one was leaving. She said, she said, I understand why you're here. She said because you're doing okay, right? Uh, but she said, there's one other professor and he's adjunct. And I remember her saying this because I, to be honest, when I was when I got to architecture school, I wasn't looking around for black professors. I wasn't looking around for black students. It was almost as if. Like I went in understanding what I was getting into, right? And I was like, I want to get in and get out. And I was, again, I was Drexel hopping over the Penn, hopping over to Princeton. I was just all over the place. But I remember her saying that there was one other professor and he's adjunct. And she said she had a conversation with him about how much he gets paid. And she was like, why am I doing this? And then she got out. Uh, I, another, another person I know, uh, uh, Hispanic brother, he, he got out and then he went to Europe to do uh, rendering. I won't call out his name or say where he works for now, but I he called me from Spain one time and I was knee deep in two projects. Like one was in design and the other one was in construction and I was getting very little sleep. And he said, he's on two months, he's on two months vacation. And we did our salary comps and he was making three times what I make. And he was on vacation for two months. And he said, architecture is the worst thing for you. He said, because, and I remember him saying this too. He said, they don't respect you. It will be hard for you to excel. He said, he said, you have to be 10 times as better than our white counterparts. And he, and then he goes, and then he, it, I guess it was, he just figured I would start a practice at some point. And he said, yeah, he said, they're going to have you doing homes in North Philadelphia for the rest of your life. And is, is I'm not doing homes in North Philadelphia. I would like to do homes in North Philadelphia, but I, again, I do a wide range of work, fortunately, right now. But the, the point of the matter is, is that, you know, my ignorance in, because it was ignorance, 
in just going through the profession and just saying, okay, this is what I want to do with the discipline and kind of having this artistic mindset did blind me to the conditions that I was sitting in. Again, I don't think you should be, I don't think, I think schools need to do better before they start going to, to communities to take kids to put them in far more challenging uh, conditions. Yeah. And I was thinking what you said, um, uh, architecture is a terrible profession for, uh, for you. It, it, it's, it's like what profession is a good profession? <laughs> it's sort of, it's so, such a <laughs> systemic problem that, um, you know, I wonder, I'm sure architecture is terrible in lots of ways for people of color, but you know, isn't- No, I, so right, but I, I, and I, 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 no, I agree. So I don't, I think architecture has the ability to change quickly, right? Um, will it want, will, will, does it want to? That's, that's another question. And what professions should people go into, especially like if you want to operate in the built environment. I've had I've had black students who I've taught or, or have been at the schools where I've taught who have reached out to me and say, listen, can you can we have a conversation? And I said, this profession may not be for you. Right? For whatever for multiple reasons. I don't just say because maybe they're doing it work wise, but you know, they they're at home, this is a challenging situation, right? And Architecture is not going to yield what they what they mean want or need in X years that they come out. So conversations. However, in terms of being impactful, there's a lot of other things that that students into. Um, that's more impactful on the built environment. But that that also comes a question of, of the agency of architecture on what you want to do and how impactful you you intend to be. Um, yeah, I think. That, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No. So one is to do an affordable housing development project here in, in Los Angeles it was with a, with a nonprofit organization and they're a developer. And one thing that we came, we came across is this significant tax credits if you've done 10 different, if you have done 10 different affordable housing projects in the past. Sounds great, but what that does is keep the same pool of architects working on the same project, working on these projects and, and prevents from communities that they may come from. Right, that's a challenge. So, so being so now, if you say, all right, what if you were, planner, if you work for the city or an urban planner, where you work for the city, you you now have agency and a voice to make policy changes that architects don't necessarily operate in a, a lot of the time. So, I I've, I've had these conversations with practitioners in the past who've transitioned into that because that's what they're more interested in. You guys have had um, Elizabeth Timmy. Who changed her entire business model based on that premise of the best way to be impactful in, in, in communities? Yeah, uh, that's so that that question of the agency of architecture. So I was wondering, in your in your experience and the work that you've done, have you had opportunities to um, address, say, like the inter the intergenerational wealth gap that all of these decades and decades of racist policies and practices have? created um, and whether that, and if, and if so, in what ways have you had a chance to do that? But if not, what are your thoughts on how architects can play a role in a system that's clearly somewhat rigged, like what you just said about tax credits? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a, it's, it's a challenge from, from the architect's seat, but there, also, there are opportunities, you know, for instance, the project that, the project that I showed in Philadelphia, we, we ultimately did not move move forward with. You know, the developer will come in, and, and you automatically see them as your client. Uh, I tend to look at it a little bit differently. I think I see them as a partner, and our client is a larger community. So part of that too is talking with your partner, and you're trying to convince them about the benefits of doing some of the things that that we're talking about doing. Right? What's the what's the benefit to a developer if you go if if they say, look, we we know we only need affordable housing what's the benefit to go to 25 percent those are the conversations that you have to have and you know you talk about good design it's focused on aesthetic at the practice but it's also performance so before we even get to the aesthetics of the project we're trying to figure out the metrics of success in terms of its performance and a lot of times that performance might be things that you don't even see and that's it how do we address some of these other societal issues that's happening around us we create more public space for the community to allow them to have these informal economies to take place where they get to set up shops, sell goods, etc. 
TV? How do we talk about there's a lack of, you know, um, engagement within the arts within this community, even though University of Pennsylvania is less than four miles away, Drexel University is less than four miles away. Well, can we create this cultural container that allowed that to happen here as well and they feel that, and again, be a conduit to that. Um, that, you know, there are a lot of people, I would say this is that not, it not only has early where I was just kind of tunnel vision, not, oh yeah, a little bit tunnel vision in my interest in the discipline and the arts. I was also extremely lucky. Like I had a series of events that got me into architecture, right? And allowed me to continue to persevere. There are people who are not as fortunate, who maybe have gotten to it later and didn't have some of the resources that I had. So again, I'm constantly thinking of ways to be a conduit to, to a, lot of, a lot of different things. I love what you said about that mindset that, the, that you think of the developer who, um, who is somebody that has a fair amount of power, um, but to think of them as a partner rather than the client and that the client is the community. I, I just want to restate that because I think that's a brilliant like, little mind twist um, that you know when I when I worked on um, projects for developers that was not at all how we did it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband is a developer, so I, I get that you know they're just a person. They just happen to also have all the access to all the money, um, and they work the system. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but to have them as a partner, that's that's a really powerful combination because developers can't do what architects do, um, and so that's great. We, we actually, um, I have a bunch of other questions, but we have a number of questions that have come in and a couple of folks want to ask their question directly. So I thought this might be a good time to just take a, a little pause and um, hear from some of them. Um, so I was going to ask Nide if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hello. Hi, Corey. How are you? How are you? Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, brilliant lecture. Um, Sort of sharing your your education and some of the projects you've worked on. Um, the project I was going to ask you actually is not specifically about the project, but just your point of view with regards to um, architecture in Africa. Um, I grew up in West Africa, and you know, spent my formative years there, and subsequently arrived in the U.S. Oh, even though I was born here, I went there as a toddler and then came back older. Um, and it's interesting seeing your competition entry for this school and seeing also um, latest entries or designs from architects from the West that are designing in Africa. For example, you have um, a very prolific architect, Toshi Toshiko Mori. She's Japanese. She's done some wonderful projects in Africa. You have Francis Carey has done um, great amounts of architecture. My, my question to you is just sort of sussing out your point of view with regards to these sort of new types of architecture that are happening in Africa, where seemingly it, it looks, you know, from a surface point of view that there's a lot of uh, critical regionalism in terms of the approach to the design. What I what I'm interested in is seeing how Africa as a as a continent is sort of moving in a in a trajectory that's very different than the Western model. The Western model is sort of based on you know enlightenment and technology sort of happening in a fairly linear fashion, whereas Africa, because of the uh, of technology is able to sort of leapfrog some of these linear timeline, right? Like, you know, the time, the time I was in Africa in the eighties compared to me going back now and seeing such uh, a sharp change in the landscape, all due you know, to technology. An example would be like, you know, when I left my grandmother, she works the market, she sells chickens in the market. We go visit her in the stalls versus when I went back 10 years later and I'm visiting her in the same market and she's calling in her orders on her cell phone, you know, as opposed to like waiting three days for somebody to deliver. So you see that sharp increase um, or, or projection in, in, in the landscape, which some people look at and they go, you know, is it, uh, you know, an idea of Afrofuturism that's happening? How do you see, um, you know, that landscape of architecture developing uh, in not this linear fashion, and I'm saying specifically with Africa, 
based on that overlay of technology. For example, that school that you designed, I wouldn't be surprised at its implementation that they have LED panels and stuff in those classrooms and they have ports for the uh, iPhones and whatnot. So it's a very interesting construct that I'm acutely interested in and seeing what comes out of it. What is this new Africa that's emerging with this overlay of technology? So if you can comment on that as you see it relating to architecture, that would be fantastic. Oh yeah, no problem. Oh, thank and thank you very much uh, for the question. And it's it's funny that you mentioned the PV panels. I'm I'm doing a school in Burundi now, and we we're looking at that. We're looking at okay, we could design it right now, but probably the the land is already acquired. Um, they want to start start construction now, but it probably won't be built for the next three years. In an adjacent town, they've seen significant growth in the last three years, right? Similar to what you just talked about where, you know, there were 10 roofs three years ago, and now it's, you know, it's changed. That's quite, quite a bit, not only in the, not only in the, uh, the built construct, but as you mentioned, techno phones, there's a uh, Wi-Fi, right? So those are, those are things to consider. I, I, I do somewhat disagree that it's, 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 the technology is moving faster than the West. I think that I think that it's moving at a at a rapid pace, and it's avoiding a lot of. It has its own unique set of bureaucracies operate, as you know, operating in, in any country in Africa or anywhere. And but it's in some ways it's less arduous than the than here in the in the U.S. And that's allowed it to be great. Uh, I, I give an example of a country like uh, Rwanda. Rwanda has grown tremendously. And if you can also consider that it's a landlocked country, it doesn't have a port, where it's relied on technology to grow, that's allowed it to be what it is. And I think it's right now, it's ranked as the third best place to do business in the world. And I, and I do believe that a lot, there are other African countries that are following this similar model where they're, where they're focused on education and technology. Also, its population growth is one of the highest, as a continent, is one of the highest in, in the world. And it's also seeing an influx, right? You're seeing, they're seeing an influx of, of you know, Chinese migrants uh, moving there. So, that only, so they're also bringing another set of resources uh, to the continent that they didn't have in the past. I, I am, I look, I enjoy working on the continent and I, and I do keep saying continent because a lot of times you say African people think that it's just one country, but I do, I do enjoy working, working on the continent uh, for, for several reasons. I, my first trip to Kigali, honestly and truly felt as if I was in Jamaica. Whenever I'm in a new place, I get a sense of that place. And I remember calling home and telling my mother, I feel like I'm home here. Uh, similarly, you get the similar feeling when you're in, in, in let's say, uh, Lagos. Uh, but you also see how these countries are growing phenomenally, and I, I, I think it's exciting. One of the things that I am concerned with, wary of, in a sense, is, yes, Tashiko Mori's project is amazing. Um, I, I hope that these three schools, that, that once they get under construction, it ends up being what we think it will be, and that will be <laughs> amazing. But at the same time, is is to be sure that we're learning from those that's there. Is that is that we're not coming in with the mindset of we know more than you, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, that's never how I approach a project anyway. But I want to make I, I try to emphasize that as much as possible. Whenever I talk about operating in the space, is that you know I go there and try to learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible, to then decide what it is we're going to do and design around. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Uh, yes, it, it, it does. I think um, it, it does. And I agree with what you're saying with regards to, um, you know, designing for the place as opposed to importation. And you do see that, you know, understandably, there's ravages of colonialism um, that's still affecting even the architecture. It's not unusual to be there and see a building and you go, what does this building have to do with this place? It looks like <laughs> a building that could be in downtown Los Angeles or Washington, D.C. Uh, but I think, you know, with the example that you showed and also of some architects that are paying attention to the place, to the resources that are funding um, the architecture. Um, but, I, but I think what I was asking it has to do with this, the fact that technology is allowing most African nations to, and third world nations actually really, to sort of not 
operate in a paradigm that's similar to the way the West developed, which is sort of like, and we use the phone as an example. You get the landline, and then it became now that nobody's using landline, they're using phones. In Africa, they skip the landlines. They just jump straight from, you know, tying a message to a pigeon to a cell phone, <laughs> you know, which, which actually has, and you see the architecture sort of developing in that similar fashion, which is interesting trying to anticipate what version of architectural language is going to shake out of that, you know, just by this overlay of technology. But I appreciate your, um, your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nide. Great perspective. Um, yeah, it always blows my mind when people say Africa thinking, I know, I know you obviously didn't say that, but people, there's so many Americans who think Africa is a country. And then when you see that map where the United States is imposed on Africa, and we look like uh, a tiny country in that continent. It's, it's amazing. Um, all right, I have one other live asker, and then we also have a couple others from the chat, and that would be Jack Broderick. Do you wanna... Yes. Um, hi, I really enjoyed your lecture. I, like, I wrote down a ton of notes. Um, we talked a lot about the intersections between architecture and different um, forms of like medias of art. Um, I'm like particularly interested in like the intersection between architecture and cinema, especially when it comes to how like the advancement of technology, um, when you hear about like products like the volume that uh, Lucas Films is using to film their things and they build this whole world and then they put it on the screen and then that's the green screen. Um, I was interested, like, do you think that there is going to be like a potential for like careers more uh, with com uh, combining like architecture and maybe cinema or like with storytelling as well in the future as these technologies advance? No, that's 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 a great question, and and actually that's what brought me to Los Angeles. I I met a, men a gentleman named Benjamin Bratton. Long story short, who we were to had a conversation about cinema and architecture, and I was very I'm very I am I remain still very much interested in cinema. Um, pre pandemic, we were setting up to do a an installation that was more revolved around cinema than architecture, where we were going to take drones and project these interviews of the homeless onto um, onto walls throughout USC and have them tell their stories through these drones and catch people at different moments. Like that was something that we were like really excited to do. And, uh, you know, in that collaboration with, with this was uh, the decision I was having with, with a professor at the School of Cinema and Arts at USC. I didn't have a conversation, it, was, it wasn't a conversation with, with any, anyone in architecture. I will say this, so even when I studied at Cornell, uh, one of the things I used to, please don't say this to Brian because I don't want him to hate me. But I, one of the things I always said was, I don't, I, I'm not going to let architecture get in the way of my architecture education. And as I practice, I don't let get architecture get in the way of my architecture, right? So I, I, I just, I, it may be innate, it may be something, because I don't forcefully do it, but I have a tendency to look outside of the discipline for a lot of things to inform what I do within it. Um, that also has led to, uh, right now, just had a conversation with Respawn Entertainment, who does video games, and talking about doing video game environments, right? So even looking at the software tools to do that, whether it be Unreal, Maya, 3S Max, those are tools that you use in architecture to represent your architecture. Uh, those are the same tools that you use for video games. And that's the same tools that, you know, there is a, there's a thread there where you could present your work through stories. For instance, my studio that I teach presents their work through storytelling by using Unreal and Twinmotion. And the investigation of the design studio and the work that they would do was through storytelling and narrative building. So, so no, I, 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 so the way that I practice, again, it's it, different architects practice differently, but I do believe that for, for me, there's just this any connection with that. And that's something that you wanted to pursue. You should absolutely, absolutely do it, right? But you have to be all in too, right? You have to, you have to that's the, the other thing too, and not to just jump in and answer something you didn't ask, but you have to be willing to make mistakes and understand that you'll learn from them. I think that's the one thing that students have a tendency to be so nervous about is making a mistake versus my thing is like, go big or go home. Like if, I'm, if I say I'm gonna make a, you know, a two minute you know, a video, as I said, if I'm a student, I say I'm gonna two minute, two minute video telling the story of my project, then I'm really gonna sit down and spend sleepless nights on Unreal, on whatever other engine, learning it, writing it out, speaking to, different departments at my university that's at my disposal and figuring that out. So. 
thank you so much. It's just like trying to figure out where to start and what classes to take. But I got yeah. some people sent me some recommendations while we were talking. So All right, great. <laughs> I'm going to try to take one of your classes in the future too. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, we, we, and we still have a couple other questions, but that what uh, your answer kind of um, uh, relates to this question that I do want to make sure I ask you, and then we'll get to the a couple other of the audience questions. Um, which is how how has your um, I know you've uh, done a fair amount of teaching now, and um, I was wondering how your approach to teaching architecture might vary or or differ from the ways that you were taught. Um, you know, I, I, that's actually something that I, I, I thought about maybe last year because when I was at Drexel, Drexel is a, is a transient school. I, I didn't have a desk at Drexel, put it like that, right? So uh, a lot of what I, what I did was, let's say studio work was I'd come into studio for the most part to present. And a lot of what I took, took in was like taking my education in my hands. Again, seeking out professors on off time, talking to people outside, whether it be other, other schools. So, so when, I, when I teach, I, I'm really, I, I, don't, I don't profess. Is I, I try to get, I try, first thing I ask, I always ask students, where are you from? What got you into architecture? Uh, I try to understand their interests in a particular prompt and then evolve that project through their particular interest. And then I do put a lot of onus on students to take that education, to take their education in their hands and not look for me for every single answer, right? I think that's, that's, that's one thing that, that's, a, that's something that I've actually been surprised by in the few, in the, the, the years that I've been teaching is how often, you know, some students will, will look to you immediately for every design decision. And I would say, well, you you know, a lot of times too, I'll say, well, you told me in the beginning, you got into architecture because you wanted to design, right? But you don't want to make any decision related to design. And then we'll have a conversation on that. But a lot of my, the one thing that I do, I do try to do in my studios is that within the given prompt is if there's nine students is that we have nine, maybe seven different projects, right? And because each one is approaching it from a different perspective, rather than me telling them you have to go about it this particular way and we have the same thing just in different stylized form forms of it um nonetheless they do take my approach of intense research and in, in some sort of interdisciplinary connection yeah yeah and um i you know which leads me to one of the questions that came in the chat and now um the asker also has his hand up so i was just gonna um ask him um to unmute and go ahead, Tobias, and ask your question about engaging communities. Because I've been wondering this on the sense of how do you engage, how do you really do that in a meaningful way in the academy, you know, when you have one semester to do it and then you got to move on. So, but he's asking more uh, to do with um, uh, project specific, I think. So, Tobias, do you want to ask your question? Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the presentation. I learned a lot and a lot of things that us as students and our kind of my friends have uh, not really understood about the industry on the inside. Um, first, I was uh, I grew up in Kenya, and so I saw a lot of architecture that from east and west came in um, by like very typical uh, general institution structures. A lot of brutalism, a lot of big concrete kind of structures that would work in in places like Europe or China, but didn't really work in Nairobi. And especially when it came down to the small things like schools and um, hospitals in, in the field, they were very badly designed. So I was wondering, I'm very interested in your work in South Sudan and how, because uh, my, my dad actually works there, and how you um, involve community, especially a community that because a lot of communities aren't architects, so they won't necessarily be able to relate, but also the added barrier of being a different culture. How do you involve them in the... the um... oh, and yeah, so how do we involve them in the process? I think that was, that was the end. These, that, that is always a challenge when you're coming in from an outsider. I, I will be honest, is that no matter where I operate, I really feel as if I, I am an outsider. Uh, I feel like I'm an outsider in Los Angeles to a certain degree, but it also gives me 
a certain perspective and helps with my approach uh, to the work is that I, I fully admit that and I'm aware of what I don't know and very interested and eager to learn. So the first thing is, again, is just sit down and listen and understand their needs. The other thing too is, what you mentioned is a good, is a good point, is how you speak to the community. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm teaming with a, with a well-known, I'm teaming with a well-known uh, architect on, with a well-known architect and then a, another firm on a project. And sometimes you could hear where they speak to the community as if they're talking to other architects and the community immediately like shuts them off. Like, I don't understand what you're, what you're saying, right? And because we, we built up a certain lexicon that we have and we, we like to speak to each other from in its ivory tower and you just can't. And it's not meeting someone down on their level, it's meeting them at their level, right? And saying, well, you understand what you're going through and I understand it from another perspective. And the other thing too to acknowledge is the systems that come into play on why the, why the, why the conditions that the community is in where it is, where it is and sometimes that's where we start the conversation, right? Where are the systemic issues that's taking play here? And why are you, why is this condition here? And a lot of times that, that opens up a door to, to then start to have a conversation about actual architecture. The other thing too, is that, you know, you mentioned bringing in outside typologies to spaces where it may not work. I have absolutely no clue what the design is gonna be like for any particular project for a while, right? Uh, I'll get the prompt today, got the prompt for a house in, in Utah, and that's a house. And I have no idea what that's going to be. So I, there's no way that I know that I knew for the school in South Sudan, what that's going to look like based on precedent projects from the West. There's, there's no way. And even the precedent projects that we looked at in the region, you know, a lot of that, again, took cues from outside resources that, that didn't work. So it's, it's, it was a research process that we also get the community engaging. It's getting, coming through a research process on the spaces that they currently inhabit, have them be part of the design as well. Um, there's a lot of, there's a slew of different techniques you could use, but I, I honestly and truly, I don't know. I think, I think the community has a sense of recognizing empathy and understanding very quickly. And when they understand that, then it, it's, the door is pretty much open, open widely. Great. Okay. Um, we have one or two. I think one might just have come in. Yes. Um, before that one, though, we had a question from Duong. Um, Duong, do you want to ask, ask it directly or would you like me to ask it for you? Um, I can ask it uh, directly. Um, so thank you so much for the kind of insightful stories of your life and your education. It really drives me to think deeper into the diversity role in the uh, study of architecture and a practice of architecture too. Um, I just want to ask in specific to the last project that you presented, uh, what kind of specific strategies did you employ uh, to ensure kind of like inclusivity and affordability for living residents in the uh, 20 unit types that you are presented? Because it's very impressive to have that amount of uh, you know unit types and then still ensuring people still have the access to uh, open spaces and uh, you know outdoor spaces within the building. Right, so, so I kind of I work backwards with that in terms of having access to, to open space. Uh, a, well, a, a, I did read him called Charles Courier a long time ago, and one of the things that he mentioned that I that really stuck in my mind was three three levels up. You're you're removed from public space. So in designing the pro in designing any project, I try to have public space within within two two <laughs> two levels and. Mm -hmm. Prompted having that open space uh, to the to the end in the middle that you saw. In terms of uh, and then in terms of having you know x percentage of affordable units. To be honest, that that's a conversation that came up with the developer, and we're talking about look, you know, what's your what's your gain loss ratio if if you do that? You always have the same way that I always tell students the same well people, but you know. When students present, when we present projects, we're presenting almost like a value proposition to some things that we introduce that they may not have asked for. And for, for me, so a lot of these addressing social issues, sometimes we have to talk about the value proposition. That was a tough one to sell. That was a tough one to get them to agree to, but he did, he did agree to it. But then there's also projects where, there's a project that we're looking at in, uh, 
in Crenshaw right now where the community wants 100% affordable housing and the developer wants to do 18% affordable housing. That's a wide gap, right? So as, as the architect, I'm trying to you know, negotiate this in a way that makes sense for both sides. That's a challenge. Um, so I, I really don't have an answer in terms of how do you, like, who do you go to for that? It's just, it's one of the many hats that architects tend to wear that we have to wear is negotiator and, and, and again, try to get the people with the resources to, to do what's good for the broader community and not just necessarily what's good financially. But that's a, that's a tough one. But that's the challenge of working in communities like that. Right? The conversation is quite different when we're talking about, you know, uh, art space. So we're talking about, or it used to be, let's say, uh, resident, I mean, hotels or leisure pre-COVID. But that conversation is far different. Once you start talking about, which is interesting, is the complexities of working in these, in these communities that are struggling are far greater and obviously far more impactful, but far different than what we have in the others. It seems to be as if the winners the profit margins are so slim that it's just it's just an extreme challenge is what I'm getting at. Um, I really don't have a good answer for you because if I perfected it, I would have a slow affordable housing practice right now and every developer would, would be after me. Uh, but yeah, I'm, it's something that I'm still still working on and trying to figure out. Thank you. It makes me think of, um, we, we have um, uh, a real estate dual degree program here and I've had the good luck of working with a couple of, of our real estate dual degree thesis, uh, master's thesis students, and they have, um, they've really gained a lot of knowledge about the money, like pots of money, federal money, HUD money, this kind of money, that kind of money. And that's, you know, developers have to be super savvy. So um, any any knowledge about some some incentive program that they might not know about can be very valuable to a developer. Yeah, extre extremely, but they also know that once they go down, so that's that's a developer who wants that, right? If a developer who has the resources, they'll say, we don't want to get into that lane because it also comes with certain complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, we have one further question. Um, and thank you, Maria, for chiming in on that. It's uh, Maria, um, who's um, the head of our real estate program. It's also the responsibility of the government in those jurisdictions to require that developers incorporate affordable housing in their projects, right? So it's not all on us. Um, yeah. Right. I, I, so so, and I, I'll say this. So Maria, that that's that's an interesting thing. So that last project that I showed that we already did not move forward on uh, a year ago, it was bought by another developer uh, who actually got it off the historical registry, tore the building down, and has very few. Uh, affordable housing units. So, again, you talk it's and um, you know there's also relationships with people in, in government in that in that jurisdiction that allow that to happen. So, and by a tough. truly by a truly weird uh, coincidence, my last dual degree real estate architecture master's thesis student did her project on that site. <laughs> oh really? Yes. I oh. thought, God, this looks familiar. <laughs> uh, I, I hope we have time to slide in one last question. Um, Bobby has a question about um, creative placemaking. If you want to unmute, uh, I know. Hi, um, Corey. Uh, it's been a great lecture, and a lot of things that you spoke about have really resonated with me. Um, as an artist and an urban planner, I guess my question is um, you know, what is your thought about creative placemaking? Off late, a lot of developers have tried to integrate art with, within community building. And some of the some of the case studies that I've looked at have, have had very fleeting, if um, unsuccessful, uh, you know, ventures into this, this process. And I was wondering if you, um, you know, what are your thoughts on it? And have you seen any projects or been a part of any projects that have had like a more lasting um, <laughs> experience as a result? So I'm, I'm laughing because it really feels as if these questions are coming from conversations I've had in the past like couple of days. So this is it's amazing. And the reason why I mentioned that is because I had a four hour conversation on Friday. I called a reporter to ask about a particular neighborhood. I was asked to look at a, a project here in Los Angeles. And I called, a, I called a reporter that I know who, and I said, hey, can you tell me about this neighborhood? And then she says, okay, I'm gonna get on the line with you and, I'm, gonna, and I, I'm going to get this community leader from that neighborhood to get on the call. 
trust me, this story's going somewhere. So it's I'm on the line with the reporter who who looks at the urban who looks at a lot of different projects, uh, looks at basically the entire urban fabric in South South Central Los Angeles, and I have this community leader on the line, and then they say, "Hey, have you heard of X Firm?" And I said, "Yeah, they just won this award, this amazing award for a project that's in your community, and it's it's like a tactical urbanism project where it's, it's really art based, and then." If you read all of the stuff that they won for the award, they talk about how amazingly impactful it was on the community, how this, this incredible beautification on the community. And then he said, you know what? I hate that project. That's what this community person said. And I said, why? And I was shocked because again, they had just won this award for this project. And, he, and I said, why? And he said, because that project did absolutely nothing. It wasted our time. All they did was basically create this intense facade, but nobody came here to understand that within these 3.5 square miles, there are 30 gangs within this 3.5 square miles. That the mobility in this community is different and they, nobody came to ask a question about that. Nobody came to ask a question about each gang taxing the businesses, you know, and giving a tax for each business. Nobody came to say that on one block where the bus stop is, you can't even access that, that because a particular gang runs that, right? So only a certain group of people can go to that bus stop. Another sort of people have to try to navigate to another bus stop or get to the train stop. Nobody asked that. I think the one thing we have to do as artists, for instance, as I mentioned, you know, we were in conversation. It was a very, like, it was a very early conversation about, you know, the drones and what some of the things that, or some other things that we we're trying to do artistically is that, it's like the, the, the Pepon or um, Osorno's uh, projects. If you ever anybody wants to look at Pepon or Osorno, he has a very, in his work, he has a social commentary. Is that I immediately, I'm, I acknowledge that, that, that the project that I want to do with the drones is a social commentary project. It will have zero impact on the community, right? And even though that was through USC. If I did that anywhere, it would have impact on the community. I think architects have a tendency to, to not only just not understand its true agency, to challenge it, but are afraid to say when something is not as impactful as they, as they want it to be or how they, they're promoting it to be. Um, Place-making projects very, or without addressing policy, without even talking about policy has very, very little impact. Um, so I think we have to, again, I think it's about how you situate it within the narrative of how, again, the narrative of how you present the project. Because it was, it was shocking to hear not just they say that the project doesn't work, but there was this utter disdain for this project that the profession, that the discipline is lifting up, that this community member, and he's not alone, that this community member absolutely disdains. So um, I mentioned before that I feel like I operate outside of architecture a lot of times, not only in the spaces and have a different lens, but in the discipline end of itself. So that's why I speak candidly about architects and, and architecture. All right. Well, that's a, that's an interesting note to end on. Um, I know. I feel bad. I feel like I should end up something fine. far more positive. Does anybody have anything? I, I, here, I'll pull out something you <laughs> said, which is architecture has agency. And you said that a few times, so I wrote it down a few times, I think. But it's um, it's a great reminder, right? So. Um, so yeah. So I so I will I will uh, before we go I will say this then to like end on a positive note is is that I was on a panel before and I wanted somebody said that students generally come in with this real interest in having in doing good work and that being like, socially engaging and then somehow throughout its throughout their education that gets filtered away or the profession that does a good job getting that through um, I don't have uh, any I'm. I'm hopeful that this is a moment of change for society. I'm not optimistic that it is. What I am glad to see though, is that students are taking more control of being socially responsible and kind of shoot, making sure that's part of the curriculum more so than now than ever. Um, I, I think that the allies that are in architecture, and I'm not just talking about for the black community, I'm talking about for everyone, uh, have, are more energized than I personally have ever seen. I'm relatively still young. Uh, in the field, but it's more so than I've seen in my lifetime. So those are, those are the positives. I'm, I really do hope it continues past the pandemic when people start to go outside, is that they don't lose uh, lose the energy to to do great things. Corey, thank you so very much for 
the work that you've done over the course of this year with our students. I, I do hope, uh, somebody alluded to the desire to take your course in the future. I hope I can twist your arm to come back and to work with us into the future. Um, and I, I, I just have to say that, that you know, um, we create institutions to be enduring. And unfortunately, some of the institutions we create for good and some of the institutions we create are not for good. And it really means as agents of change, architects, we have to be prepared uh, to go for the long haul. Change takes a long time. I know that it, unfortunately for black people in America, 400 years is a damned long time. But um, we have to commit ourselves to keep doing it because otherwise um, you can't look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. So Corey, thank you. This is very provocative material. Best to you, best to your family and stay safe and enjoy your upcoming vacation that we talked about in the preamble <laughs> that we won't tell anybody about whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Corey. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.